Hello everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 214, which this month is pretty much going to be the only regular episode of the Dry Dock, thanks to the various circumstances I'm sure you're already aware of. Nonetheless, the questions this week are taken from Guide 257 on the Svetsky Soyuz Never Built class of battleships from the Soviet Union, uh, the video Battleship Guns of World War II, a series of tubes, and the Franco-Prussian War at Sea video. So let's get stuck in. Michael Kovacic, I think, asks, can you do a video about spaced armour? For example, the Latorios with their 70mm armour plate before the 280mm main belt. Was this system more effective than a 350mm belt? It is a video I definitely want to do at some point, but I'm still trying to do some relatively in-depth research so that I can state with a degree of accuracy whether or not the Latorios belt would have worked because the Latorios were the only capital ships of World War II that were designed with a decapping plate rather than just a straight up thick main belt. And yes, I know some people are going to jump up and say, oh yes, but the Iowas had a decapping plate. Um, no, they didn't. Um, and I know where that claim comes from. Um, it comes from the NavWeb's website uh, with an article by Nathan Oaken. But if you go back onto the website, you'll find that there's a follow-up article called Decapping Revisited um, that he's also done, which uh, in which he basically goes through in a bit more detail the exact mechanics of how decapping works and that against the kind of calibre of shells that the Iowa would have been facing in World War II, uh, the STS plating that forms the outer hull wouldn't actually have worked as a decapping plate. But Anyway, moving on from that, I say the main reason why I want to do some more work uh, with the Latorio's belt is basically uh, in, in large part because of the various bits of research that, uh, say, Nathan Oaken has done um, and a few others that have done that I've looked up. And it comes to calculating the effectiveness of a decapping belt. Now, I have mentioned this in the past in previous dry docs, so if you have heard this before, I apologise, but it's something that's been asked again, um, so I probably should just recap it briefly. The very, very short version of how a decapping plate works on a battleship scale, um, there are certain analogies to how it works with tank armour as well, but also a few differences, but effectively there are two main qualifying factors. Firstly, the decapping plate itself has to be thick enough to actually, you know, break the cap off of an incoming armor-piercing shell. Um, and there's a sliding scale for that because obviously a plate that will decap, say, a 12-inch shell may not decap a 16-inch shell or an 18-inch shell. Um, the slight weirdness is that obviously if you have a plate that's thick enough to say decap an 18 inch shell that may also act as a fuse initiator um, and possibly even a certain degree of protection against something like say an 11 inch shell but never mind so you have to get your thickness of the first plate correct and then once the decap the decapping has taken place either the l l joint between the cap and the shell has been broken there has to be sufficient space for that cap to actually meaningfully part company with the shell. And so you need a certain degree of volume between the outer decapping plate and the inner belt. If you have the two spaced too close together, then the cap won't have come off and then the shell will impact the main belt and if you've made your main belt considerably thinner because you're thinking ah oh, yes well the decapping plate will do it then effectively what you've just created is a rather poor laminate which is the equivalent of your main belt plus the or uh, decapping belt but the decapping plate as a rule of thumb if for uh, poor laminates you count it as about half effectiveness so you have a relatively thin armor belt and then overall and the shell's probably going to go through so you need this this void space and that's one of the reasons why you don't really see decapping plates on most ships because the void space the depth of the void space that you need in order to 
allow a shell to completely decap if you're talking a 15 or 16 inch shell is quite extensive and that's an awful lot of volume to give up which you know volume is a premium on a battleship now with the Littorios when you run the equations you immediately see that the gap between the decapping plate and the armor plate is actually too thin it's too it's too narrow so your first conclusion would be actually okay it's not going to work but uh, an additional part of that space is due to basically resistance you know the the air resistance which is going to be moving the cap off now with the italian form they actually filled that void space with concrete which of course has an increased density um and more recently when i've been talking to some italian historians who were actually able to read the original documentation or close to it and give a more accurate translation um, it also turns out that that is foamed concrete as opposed to just you know, big slabs of concrete now in theory obviously that means a denser medium that means the cap should come off sooner um, but I at the moment and this is the bit of research that I'm still trying to complete at the moment I don't know what the density of that foamed concrete was and that is critical because if you'd gone back to some very basic English translations where they just said oh they filled it with concrete then it would have been the most hideously inefficient armor system on the planet because if you added up the void spaces worth of solid concrete plus the outer decapping plate plus the inner armor plate not only does it take up a massive amount of volume but for the density you could have a far 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 thicker armor plate of solid steel which would have done a far better job on far less volume now if you're using foamed concrete there's there's two questions um one of which is related to the bit of research i've got to do and one of which is more general the first of which is does the foamed concrete actually have enough density to make up for the lack of depth of the armor layout um, if it does then great if it doesn't then that's a problem but of course that leads into the second problem which is similar to the slab of concrete issue which is is the weight of the concrete in that void space plus the weight of the decapping belt plus the weight of the armor belt if you add all of that up and then divide it through by the density of armor plate and so that gives you an equivalent thickness armor plate that you could just have as a as a simple form of protection easy to efficient in that manner and this is kind of where the delicate sliding scale is because if you have a really really light foam concrete then overall it, sh it should be a more efficient system but a very light foam concrete might not be dense enough to decap the shell in the limited volume whereas if you have a denser foamed concrete then it almost certainly will decap the shell but you may end up have a having actually put a far more weight and volume into the protective system than you needed to for the equivalent protection um, and wh where does the italian system sit on that scale and did they get the sweet spot of protection where they got you know light enough concrete to make it a more efficient armor system but even though they're losing out on a bit of volume um but also doing its job properly and that's the bit we don't know and yes i know some people will point to the fact that the italians tested this layout um before the war but there was a critical flaw when it came to assessing the decapping value of the armor system which is that they fired a smaller caliber round simulating the energy of a 15 inch round which in conventional tests against normal armor plate would be fine um but with decapping specifically as we said everything is proportional to the caliber of the shell the bigger the shell the more void space you need and by using a smaller caliber shell all they proved is that that layout would decap a shell at the smaller caliber um, although it had the equivalent energy of a 15 inch shell because of its physically smaller size it didn't actually prove anything about whether it would decap and therefore protect against a 15 inch shell it's just a mistake that some people make and they happen to make and that's why i still need to do more research to figure out 
exactly what the makeup of this armor system was in as I said in terms of density and then run all the numbers to try and figure out if it would have worked and then from that I can then make a video about spaced armor and say relatively confidently whether or not the Italian system would have worked because annoyingly no one actually hit a Littorio on the belt with a 15 inch shell or 16 inch shell during the war so we don't have any practical experience on whether it would have been effective against full caliber hits. Whiskey Delta Golf asks, why did the Soviet Union consider designs that followed treaty restrictions when it was not party to the naval treaties? And what would have been the consequences if they just ignored the treaty completely? Well, there were three main reasons that they considered treaty following designs, uh, one of which was, well, Soviet industry when it came to capital ship construction was somewhat limited. Uh, so going to the effort of trying to build a 40 or 45 or 50,000 ton vessel straight off the bat would have been far, far more taxing and difficult for them than building a 35,000 tonner. Um, while simultaneously, you know, having a 35,000 tonner puts them on a par with everybody else, so it's a nice sweet spot. Secondly, related to that, the Soviets had to seek a lot of assistance from foreign shipyards for the most part italian ones that were part of a nation that was bound by the treaty and that those shipyards designers nations etc would get uh shall we say a significant amount of displeasure from the other nations if they were seen to be semi-circumventing the treaty by designing beyond the what the treaty said they were allowed to design and finally, the Soviets would have been aware, as everyone else was, of the text of the treaty, because and the text of the treaty, whether it be the Washington, London, or Second London, all contained get-out clauses. So it wasn't a case of once this is signed, this is signed in blood and cannot be changed. It was a case of this is signed, and as long as everyone goes along with it, we're fine. But, as I said, there were clauses in there that effectively amounted to and if something changes materially, everyone reserves the right to do something else, agree something else. And so, um, again, kind of linking back to the first issue, the Soviets are very aware that all, pretty much all of the major nations signed up to the treaty system could comfortably outbuild them if they wanted to. And so if they built a treaty-breaking battleship... Well, if they built one, maybe people might ignore it a little bit if it was a 40,000 tonner. But if they started building a whole class of them, then it was very likely that all the other treaty nations would turn around and go, oh, fine, okay, that's cute. Well, we're going to just have to match them, except on a lot more numbers. And any advantage they might have gained would be gone. Everyone would be even more annoyed with them. To be fair, the USSR may not have cared that much, but it might have led to an end of the technical assistance programs. And as I said, it would have been a much bigger challenge for Soviet industry in the first place. So it just made sense to try and initially stick with a 35,000 ton battleship. Lone Wolf asks, um, you said the Pugliese system for torpedo defense was tested by the Soviets and found to be inferior to expectations. But on the other hand, Italian war report said it operated well. Could you shine some light on how the system works and if there are any hypotheses as to why the Soviet test model failed? So I did clarify this with a brief response at the time in that particular video um, in the comment section, but I'll expand here. So the Soviet testing system didn't say that the Pugliese system completely failed, but the reason they said it was inferior was because it took up a lot of volume and space and the Soviets reckoned that a more conventional layered void and liquid system could be done that would be as effective or potentially more effective than the Pugliese system and would take up less volume. So on a, you know, a volume dash weight saving metric, they thought a conventional system would work better. And you can kind of see their point. So here's a picture of a ship being built with the Pugliese system in place. You can see the cylinders either side. And you look at the overall size of the hull, then you see the two torpedo defense system, and then you see that little, what looks like almost a smaller ship being built inside the inner hull. Well, technically that's a tertiary hull when you look at the fact the outer hull is double skinned, but nonetheless, you realize that 
internal bit. That is the internal volume of the hull. The Pugliese system, regardless of overall effectiveness, takes up a huge amount of space. Um, in some ways, it reflects a lot of Italian technical solutions, especially when it comes to protection in the 1930s and 40s, so, you know, similar to the spaced armor we were discussing at the beginning, in that on paper they might may be effective, they may not be, it depends on your analysis, but even if they are effective, they take they use sort of clever gimmicks and take up a huge amount of volume in order to get that effectiveness, which in and of itself can be a problem, especially if you are trying to keep to treaty limits or a budget or a limitation in beam or anything else. Um, now, the, the idea very basically of the Bugliese system was that when the torpedo hit, the energy of the torpedo would go into crushing this big cylinder that you can see and therefore would not go further into, you know, crushing the hull inside, which then obviously would cause flooding. Um, whether or not it worked, I mean, again, on paper, in theory, it should work relatively well. Um, the the two issues more broadly with the Pugliese system, um, apart, apart from whether or not you think the principle works at all, um, which is another discussion entirely, but the, apart from the volume issues, the two technical issues with the Pugliese system is that one, um, if the system works as advertised, it only works above a certain width of tube against um, a given amount of explosives, which means that as the system narrows towards either end of the ship, as any torpedo defense system narrows, it will reach a point where it will no longer be effective. So you'll still have this large volume taken up, but it won't have much, if any, effect on the incoming torpedo, which could be a problem, especially if you're getting hit by a, a rather heavyweight torpedo. The other issue, from a technical perspective, is that it is a very much an all-or-nothing defense system. So if you have a more conventional layered liquid void, liquid void system, um, then if you get hit by, let's say, an 18-inch airdropped torpedo, your system might resist it perfectly fine. If you get hit by a 21-inch surface-launched or sub-launched torpedo, it might resist, it might fail. In theory, it should resist for most of the um, World War II schemes, at least amidships. If you get hit by a 24, 24 and a half inch torpedo, it'll probably fail, at least partially. But this is the thing, it's, a, it's degrees of failure. So even with a really big warhead, um, you might have a huge hole on the outside, but as it punches through layer after layer after layer, that energy diminishes, and the hole on the inside, in theory, even with a really big torpedo warhead, will be smaller than the hole that would have resulted on the outside. So there's a degree of mitigation. Um, if I understand the technical specs of the Pugliese system correctly, the issue, again, assuming that it works as advertised, is that if you overwhelm it, then once it has failed, it basically acts as if it wasn't there at all so if your system is rated for let's say a 21 inch torpedo with a typical world war ii warhead and somebody hit you with a 24 inch long lance then that long lance will do significantly more damage to the interior part of the ship that you don't want flooded when the system fails as compared to an equivalent liquid void liquid void layered system which although it also would have failed it will have mitigated a lot more of the explosive power knight 6831 asks could operation tungsten's air attack from hms victorious and hms furious have sunk the turpits in theory potentially yes in practice and all practicality probably not so with operation tungsten you had three sets of three different types of bombs being carried um you had a total of about 42 aircraft 42 barracudas assigned to actually launch the attacks um but you had 
general purpose bombs which were designed to basically blow stuff up on the upper surfaces of turpits anti-aircraft guns and do etc do general damage you had other um time fuse bombs designed more for anti-sub work which were designed to be dropped alongside turpits and blow out par portions of its hull by exploding alongside or underneath it and then you finally had 1600 pound armor piercing bombs which were designed to punch through the relatively heavy deck armor and actually do serious damage internally now bearing in mind obviously just how much damage the thousand pound bombs carried by dauntlesses and hell divers could do to japanese warships including yamato a 1600 pound bomb potentially can do even more unfortunately during the actual operation tungsten air attack one there weren't that many 1600 pound bombs carried because a bunch of other 500 pounders of varying types being taken around but also you when you are conducting dive bombing attacks you have this kind of dichotomy of if you release higher then the velocity of the bomb when it hits is greater and its armor piercing capability is greater but you stand more of a chance of missing and if you release lower then you stand more of a chance of hitting but the bomb itself has less armor penetration and there was a minimum 3000 foot ceiling um for releasing the 1600 pound bombs above which they were relatively confident that they would go through Tirpitz's armor but it turns out pretty much all the barracuda pilots for various reasons released below that altitude presumably to get more accurate hits and so Bismarck's main armor deck protection remained unbreached although the upper works were seriously messed up so in theory if the barracudas that were carrying the 1600 pounders had dropped from let's three and a half four thousand feet then the mathematics says that they should have penetrated the armor deck the question then would be how far would they have penetrated the armor deck because they would have gotten into machinery spaces and so forth it's possible they could have got lucky and pulled off a uss arizona style thing and hit a magazine um doesn't even necessarily have to be a a 15 inch magazine it could have been one of the 5.9 inch magazines uh and you know caused a major explosion that could have then ended up sending turbots to the bottom um they if they'd scored multiple hits on the machinery spaces they could have in theory breached the lower hull and caused massive flooding in the machinery spaces which also could have sunk the ship but statistically speaking they're just weren't enough aircraft carrying 1600 pounders for that to be a realistic prospect like i said on paper if every 1600 pounder had hit and been released from 4000 feet then sure um decent ish chance of sinking bismarck but that in and of itself was unlikely to happen the other potential although be very very um reliant on the actual bombardment of turpits itself by 1600 and 500 pounder bombs as well the other potential way of sinking turpits would have been for more of the anti-sub fused bombs to detonate in a pattern alongside turpits on both sides and blow in blown in a bunch of the hull plating um probably not quite enough to breach the torpedo protection amidships but certainly if they'd caused a lot of flooding at either end then they could potentially have exploited the fact that Tirpitz, like Bismarck, has the rather unique, uh, if not particularly brilliant, distinction of being the only World War II warship which couldn't actually remain afloat if its citadel was unbreached. The citadel volume was too low. If you flooded everything that wasn't the citadel on any other ship, King George V, Latoria, Richelieu, Iowa, etc., the ship would be in a lot of trouble, but the interior volume of the citadel space would act basically as a giant life belt and keep it afloat assuming it didn't roll over whereas on bismarck and turpits that volume was too low and flood everything else and it would sink so in theory if you blew enough holes in the side of turpits especially fore and aft and then maybe blew a bunch of holes in the top with the 500 and 1600 pounders then even if it didn't breach the armor deck that could have resulted in gradual flooding which would have 
sunk tirpits, although given that she was moored in a fjord with assistance nearby, they probably would have been able to get enough pumps there to keep up with it. Um, so again, it's a theoretical on paper capability, um, but in, again, in practice, probably not going to happen. Um, the slightly odd thing, of course, is that had Tirpitz been mobile and at sea, although that increases the difficulty of actually hitting her in the first place, a lot of the caveats that we just mentioned probably wouldn't have applied. So, you know, Tirpitz being hit by 42 dive bombers and a bunch of incoming fighters suppressing her defences, if they'd hit her at sea, and stressing if they'd actually got a significant number of hits, kind of like with the American attacks on Yamato, would stand a better chance of putting her on the bottom than when she's moored in a fjord. Whomever asks, were lightning strikes a serious problem for wooden sailing ships in a storm, and are there any well-documented cases of fires being started by them? Uh, yes, lightning strikes were a huge problem for wooden sailing ships um, in storms and other weather conditions throughout the Age of Sail. Um, lightning strikes were one of the more common ways for Royal Navy ships to get damaged and have to pull into port uh, during peacetime and even during blockade duty as well in wartime. So yeah, definitely not something to be underestimated. Now, as far as fires being started by them, that was slightly less common. It did happen, but given that you would usually be hit by lightning in the middle of a driving storm, well, everything would be exceptionally wet, and even lightning would have trouble setting fire to things at that point. Where you did get fires breaking out would either be where you had lightning coming in relatively unexpectedly, you know, lightning out of a clear blue sky, or lightning perhaps at the beginning of a severe weather system that had just blown in, so the ship hasn't had a time to get properly soaked. Also, secondary effects of the lightning. So there are a number of cases where uh, powder stored on the ship, usually not the magazines, but powder stored elsewhere on the ship, or other flammables could be set on fire by the lightning traveling through the ship, and that fire could spread, especially because obviously if it's in the interior, the ship is like much more likely to be dry in those areas. Um, another major problem for the ships was that basically, in most cases, when a mast got hit, the mast naturally would contain moisture anyway, but especially if it was you know in the middle of a storm, it would be very, very moist. Um, and, of course, the lightning would cause all the water to superheat into steam, uh, which would expand, which is not a good thing if it's trapped inside the mast. Uh, it's not a good thing to have superheated steam expanding inside anything that you didn't intend to it to expand into. Um, but anyway, it would tend to blow apart the mast. As you can see here, this is HMS Suriname having been hit in the main mast by lightning. Now, when that happens and the mast just tends to explode into a shower of splinters and fragments, one, um, that in and of itself usually can kill or wound people on deck or, if they're really unlucky, on the mast at the time. Um, but also you tend to have very big chunks of the mast, the yards and rigging, then plunging down into the ship and basically lancing straight into it, which of course can cause significant damage to the ship, which may then you know cause it to sink. In some cases, it's actually remarked that the ships that were hit by lightning were very lucky because even though the mast in question was blown to pieces, all the various chunks were still held up by the rigging, um, usually obviously that attack being attached to the mast that hadn't been blown to small pieces, and therefore they didn't have huge chunks of wood pile driving their way into the ship. Um, so yeah, basically, lightning strikes, yes, a huge problem for wooden ships, um, Fires, however, whilst documented, are actually much less common than you might imagine relative to the number of lightning strikes. Bradley asks, would it have been possible to make the Jeune École work with submarines and coastal battleships rather than cruisers and torpedo boats? Kind of, maybe. Um, it's kind of one of those questions to which the answer is both yes and no, because fundamentally... Either way, the Jeune École is about having small torpedo-armed craft that can therefore sink much larger, more expensive battleships and cruisers, along with some kind of offensive surface-based ship to allow for uh, 
in the case of the cruiser option, raiding the enemy's commerce, in the case of the coastal battleship option, to provide a somewhat more substantial and permanent coastal defence, whilst presumably in the latter case the submarines do the work of attriting down the enemy fleet. Um, the fundamental issue with the Jeune Ecole, as I've said before, is that you are trying to outdo a larger navy, which is presumably being funded by a larger, more powerful economy, by coming up with a smaller, cheaper solution. And the fundamental flaw with that is that, well, the other guy can just outmatch you in your small, cheap solution, possibly build, well, most likely building slightly better versions of your small, cheap solution, because they can afford to, which negates your solution, and they can still afford a major battle fleet once the smoke is cleared, at which point you lose. Um, that That's kind of a bit of an issue. The other issue, specifically with the French trying to make the Jeune École work, is their proximity to its target, i.e. Britain, because it means if Britain builds a bunch of small craft, well, they've only got across the channel to fight the French ones, so you know, see previous statement. Now, the Jeune École as a overall principle of using small, cheap, effectively fast attack craft to make things too difficult for a large navy to come after you can work in circa certain circumstances. Because the other thing that the Jeune École theoretically was supposed to do, apart from, um, you know, eventually sink the enemy fleet, was also to keep the enemy blockade away from your shores. Now, if you have a large coastline and you happen to be very far away from your enemy and anywhere the enemy might base their ships from, then I think you could make the Jeanne École work because if you are far away from the enemy's ability to base their ships, then even if they build something to match your small fast attack craft, chances are their small fast attack swarm won't be physically able to reach you at which point it is the you know bigger more expensive ships versus the smaller faster ships that can hurt them and then additionally if you have a very large coastline then the enemy's relatively speaking few large expensive ships that are now vulnerable have to cover a fairly large expanse anyway and if they face this threat, they have to back off a little bit, but that exponentially increases the amount of area they have to patrol, which will effectively break their blockade. So if you were someone, someone like, say, the United States, and you were building a Jeune Ecole style fleet to counter a European power that wasn't Britain, then it would work. Because, you know, if you've got a ton of whether there be submarines and coastal battleships or cruisers and torpedo boats, if they are, you know, swarming on the US coast, then the nearest port that any of the European powers have, maybe a Dutch or French or maybe Spanish colony in the Caribbean, which is going to be relatively small, not be able to handle a huge amount of shipping anyway, and in any case is still relatively distant from most of the US coastline, so therefore the fl enemy can only turn up with a small portion of their fleet and it's going to have to be the longer range portions of their fleet at which point they're going to have to stand off a distant blockade the u.s coastline is too large to blockade at that distance and if they come any closer you know you swarm them with torpedoes um the only one where you might argue whether or not that approach would work might be with the british because they have bermuda they have halifax and they have a number of ports in the vicinity of the US coastline at various points and of course they have a very big fleet so they potentially might be able to base a significant number of ships including a bunch of fast attack craft nearby to negate that but that's a separate argument to have as to whether or not the exact what exact capabilities are but then you can apply that not just on a great power scale but all the way down to small power scale so effectively yes the Jeune Ecole can be made to work but you need, you need to have, compared to your opponent's fleet, a relatively large coastline, and you need to be very far away from them. Um, if you have a small coastline, or you happen to be within fast attack craft range of your opponent, 
and your opponent is larger than you, it's not going to work. Bounty Flamour asks, did the Union have the same troubles enforcing the blockade on the CSA as the French had on the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War? Uh, now, this was particularly, if you watch that video, particularly because of coal supply issues, but also manpower issues. And the answer is, although the Union did have some issues, they didn't have anywhere near as many. Um, whilst the situations were relatively similar in some aspect, they were actually quite dissimilar in others. Um, for one thing, whilst there was a split in the US fleet to a certain degree when you know, the Confederacy formed itself, by and large, the Union didn't have a huge majority of its sailors on the other side of the Atlantic fishing at the time of the war breaking out, so their initial cadre of experienced sailors was actually available, um, which allowed them to then expand quite rapidly. Also, despite the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War being, on average, about seven years apart, I mean, it gets a bit closer, a bit further away, depending on whether you look at the start or end of each war but you know even though it's between half a decade and a decade apart which isn't a huge amount of time in terms of ship development at the time it is actually quite a significant difference um, so there were a much greater proportion of fast steam powered say um, fast steam powered merchant ships by 1870 as compared to 1863 they existed in 1862, 1863, 1864, um, but being much, much rarer, that's why you had specific Confederate blockade runners, um, whereas by you know, 1870 it was, well, not quite, but almost the standard, um, and therefore it was much easier to run a blockade under steam when your enemy had limited coal available. So a significantly larger majority of merchant ships that were heading for the confederacy in the american civil war either would have been purely sail powered or if they had steam engines they would have been very much auxiliary and not capable of moving them at any particularly great speed they would have just been more you know a myth method of propulsion when the wind was contrary or when there wasn't a wind at which point the both the sailing and hybrid warships of the union would be able much more able to you know run them down and also because in the early 1860s steam was still very much an auxiliary system ships relied far less on their steam engines and therefore you know any issues you might have had with the logistics of getting coal to and from the ships were somewhat less important because they were going to be using their engines significantly less Whereas by the time of the Franco-Prussian War, a good chunk of the ironclads not necessarily needed to have their steam engines online at all times, but it was probably highly advisable, combined with the fact, as I mentioned, that with a much greater proportion of merchant steam shipping, you needed your steam engines to be able to capture almost any blockade runner. Whereas, as mentioned before, with the Union blockade, for the most part they could get away with chasing after them under sail and maybe occasionally having to use their steam engines. Brandon Judge asks, watching a Battleship New Jersey video, Ryan mentioned that New Jersey was inactive for over half of her career. At first I thought a ship like this would have great hull condition due to less use through wear and tear, but then I thought about it and thought of USS Midway, who was a frontline ship for most of her career, so she would require more upkeep than New Jersey sitting in port. Whose hull condition would be in better shape today, the active ship, Midway, or New Jersey, sitting for many years in the reserves? So, a lot of it is going to depend on what happened to the ship in its final years, but essentially there's two areas where one side has the advantage and then the other side has the advantage. It's a very, very broad way of determining things so not necessarily precise but for the purposes of this answer i think it suffices basically a ship that is in active service consistently will obviously suffer considerably more strain on its hull it's going to be going through active seas more often it's going to be going through heavy seas a lot more often it's going to be hitting storms a lot more often all things considered um running at full power more often, etc., etc. So the overall hull is going to be stressed 
um, potentially mildly warped if it gets into a really bad storm, um, et cetera, et cetera, wear and tear, you know, the active vessel's hull condition broadly will be in a slightly worse condition. However, a ship that's sitting in reserve in relatively placid calm waters will face a slightly greater challenge in one particular area, and that's what's called the wind water line, i.e., you know, the interface where the water level is. And that is because, you know, the water is constantly lapping around that area. With a ship that's at sea, um, it also has a wind water line, but that wind water line is much more dynamic. It's going to be changing constantly depending on how loaded the ship is, how much fuel and stores it has aboard, um, what the sea condition is, etc. So, you know, it could be lightly loaded in calm seas and the wind water lines could be really low down um, in the area where the anti-fouling paint is. It could be really heavily loaded and the water line, the wind water line might be, you know, four, five, six feet higher. Um, and if it's moving, you know, through heavy seas, then obviously that where the wind water interface could be right up on the flight deck, if we're talking about midway, it could be a dozen feet below the notional water line and everything in between. So a ship in reserve is going to have a lot more corrosion, erosion, etc. occurring at a very specific location on its hull, whereas an active ship is going to have it much more distributed uh, and therefore the impact on any individual site is likely to be somewhat less. But, so, you know, the six of one, half dozen of the other, but the one difference then is that if prior to being made a, a museum ship, both ships go through a full dry dock refit, etc., in you know the last few years of their service with the, the Navy, then in that case, the ship that sat in reserve is more likely to be in better overall shape because it would just need to be dry docked. Um, and then any issues at that relatively consistent wind water line addressed, pop it back in the water and it should be good for quite a while. Whereas the ship that spent all its time on active career duty, even if they go through and go, OK, all the external hull issues with corrosion, etc., we're going to deal with it's still going to have that wear and tear and stress and strain, etc., on its hull that it's gone through in active service. And therefore, its hull overall, over time, is starting off from a slightly more weakened state. Um, so although they would have taken, you know, potentially more care of it, more active dockings, the ship that spent most of its career active, i.e. Midway, is probably in the long, long term going to have more issues with fatigue, etc., than... New Jersey is. Vokir asks, what was the bigger logistical and industrial challenge? The deployment of rangefinders and fire control systems in the run-up to and during World War I, or radar in World War II? Now, that is a somewhat difficult one, and I suspect you could come up with different answers depending on how you define the specifics of the, the question. But for my money, I'm going to go with the rangefinders and fire control systems in the run-up to and during World War I. And I'm basing that partially on the fact that you can't really mass-produce rangefinders and fire control systems in quite the same way you can with radar. Uh, now, you can mass-produce them, but there's a lot more different ones. Now, okay, fair enough, in World War II, you have surface search, air search, gunnery control, high angle gunnery control, etc., etc., radars. But if you produce like a CXAM radar, um, an early, which is an early US one, or a Type 284 radar, um, which is a British one, that can be fitted to an awful lot of different ships. So, you know, whether it's an old Revenge class or a brand new Iowa or um, you know, a free French cruiser that happens to have rocked up, you can put a Type 284 or an SG radar, etc., on pretty much any of them. And you can even fit, to a certain extent, some of those radars on some of your larger destroyers, which means that, essentially, if you have 
X kind of radar, whatever application it might have, then you basically just need two models. You need one that can fit on most ships and you need a slightly smaller lighter weight version that can fit on some of your smaller destroyers and frigates. And once you've got one aboard, then if you want to have a second one, then that's largely for redundancy unless you've positioned the first one in such a way that part portion of the ship's superstructure blanks out part of its arc of coverage. Um, whereas when you look at rangefinders and fire control systems, again, you have weight issues. So you have to have for the fire, con for the fire control systems, you have to have versions for battleships versions for destroyers but you also have intermediate versions for cruisers and you even have smaller versions for certain battleships that can't fit the full-sized versions that you can have on your bigger battleships but then when it comes to the rangefinders you tend to ha if you want a full fit you tend to have to manufacture an awful lot more of them in an awful lot more different sizes because you know taking your average large battleship as an example in world war one you're going to have your primary rangefinder you probably want a backup to that rangefinder your turrets probably want rangefinders but they're going to be different sizes to the ones that you're using as your primary ones your secondary battery if you're going full tilt is going to need at least two rangefinders because you need one on either side probably more um and yeah so the number and different types of rangefinders are going to add up quite quickly and then the other part of my assessment at least would be the fact that by about mid-war in world war ii so we're talking about 43 44 fitting a newly launched ship with radar at least some form of radar if not multiple forms of radar was kind of the standard and any issues with radar fitting on ships tended to be well this ship has a first or second generation radar and this ship has a third generation radar we don't have quite enough third generations but we do have maybe a set, spare second generation set we can stick on this one whereas if you look in world war one even by the mid part of world war one whether or not a ship had a fire control system um, a direct con fire control system and whether or not certain parts of the ship's armament had rangefinders at all was still a serious question you know you you had you know ships in 1916 1917 on both sides and we're not talking destroyers we're talking about cruisers and battleships that were perhaps re just receiving their first serious full rangefinder and fire control suite that wasn't really the case for you know major ships in the middle of world war ii with radar systems so for that reason i would tend to go with the slightly larger challenge being the the earlier one tyler eaves asks what was done for hearing protection on world war era battleships was it just assumed that all the gunners would be deaf more or less immediately well here's a bunch of people who probably weren't in the turrets for the most part but there's some nice turrets of a world war one battleship behind them so we could make do with that anyway Although by the end of World War II you were seeing some more formalised hearing protection come into play, for the most part it was just cotton wool. Um, people just have a big chunk of it um, and then they just you know, rip chunks off, stuff it in their ears and hope for the best. Uh, this is actually borne out in uh, the Battle of Jutland, for example, when HMS Warspite's second officer found his battle station being in B turret, wandered down to it when action stations were sounded, and suddenly realized he was inside a twin 15 inch turret with no hearing protection and one of the gunners was just like here have this chunk of cotton wool <laughs> which of course he then split into stuffed in his ears and hope for the best so that was for the most part as far as the hearing protection went um despite the questionable um efficacy of lumps of cotton wool most naval gunners did actually tend to retain their hearing during the war, um, albeit that obviously some of them, as time went on, would uh, lose their hearing a little bit prematurely. But you know, the, the cotton wool, for all its relative crudity, did seem to have at least some beneficial effect. Gregory Albert asks, how would the, I believe it's pronounced, cyber cargo ship fare in sh terms of shipping during the age of sail? Possibly Seba, I don't know. So this ship, which is under construction at the moment, 
is you know a radical new advance in shipbuilding technology uh, basically for green and eco purposes they're going back to sails um, it almost feels like the sail cargo ship is like the thanos of merchant marine uh, engineering and i was like where did it bring you back to me <laughs> anyway that so they're building this thing um it's actually based on a late 19th century schooner design, uh, but obviously built with some modern materials, but the hull itself is actually being built of wood. So if you kicked this ship back into the Age of Sail, it would do relatively well. I mean, it wouldn't be remarkable for its size. There would have, there would have been and were in the classic Age of Sail considerably larger seagoing merchant vessels. But the fact that its hull is going to reflect basically the pinnacle of schooner hull design and obviously its masts and sails etc are going to benefit from modern materials and likewise you know the, the crew elements as well means it's probably going to be more efficient and a little bit faster than contemporary vessels of its approximate size. I mean it's going to be at the towards the larger end of merchant ships of the period um but as i say it's not going to be in the upper 20th percentile certainly it's got a decent cargo capacity uh, the interesting thing however is that although it is a primarily sail vessel its specifications on the website of the people who are building it also mention that it has a electric motor so presumably an underwater propeller of some kind powered by lithium-ion batteries so presumably they have some kind of either wind or solar powered charging system on deck um to to top those up at which point it would if you, you know, say kicked it back into the those times at least as long as the batteries last would probably make itself a very high-end sought after cargo ship as i say it's not going to necessarily be transporting colossal amounts of cargo compared to the, the very biggest ships but it can probably do it faster and with the engine certainly a lot more reliably um, especially when it comes to navigating against the wind or where there isn't any wind so i would anticipate it would probably aim itself at a market where you either have perishable cargo or low relatively speaking low volume but very high value cargo that you need to be delivered pretty quickly um so kind of probably a combination what they used to call specky i.e money transporting specky and mail vessel would be its best um, use as well as you know transporting against low volume high value stuff like porcelain and tea and so forth and it can guarantee regular deliveries within reason which would make it a a niche but an elite but very sought after uh, commission for various merchant companies Alec Ruby asks, in a video a while back, you mentioned that the British believe that any increase in gun calibre under 1.5 inches just wasn't worth it. And they did this all the way up to the 15 inch guns, then jumped right to the 18 inch. So my question is, why did they skip the 16.5 inch and then later I make only 16 inch guns for the G3s? Was it a change in philosophy or something else? Yeah, so the 1.5 inch step is, is basically true for the British, at least in, in 1900s world war one period and you know jumping from the 15 inch to the 18 inch was jumping two of those and it's jumping three inches i.e. two 1.5s now in terms of the 16.5 inch gun they did briefly consider it they jumped straight to the 18 because they basically they had the 15 inch gun they were aware that other people were building 16 inch gun ships and so rather than semi-match them with a 16.5 they're just like well actually you know what we're just going to go straight to 18 uh, and overmatch everybody immediately but then the 16.5 makes a very brief appearance in battle cruiser design um, in the alphabet series in the early 1920s before then being subsumed down to the 16 inch and that's basically because of infrastructure concerns they start off wanting an 18 inch battle cruiser and after a lot of back and forth they end up basically deciding that they can't get um 18 inch armament on a battle cruiser that has the speed and protection that they want so there's kind of a minimum speed requirement and a minimum protection requirement on their battle cruisers now and in order to get that plus an 18 inch armament the ship itself is far too large 
to fit in a lot of their overseas docks like Gibraltar, Malta and Singapore. And so the only they're not prepared to sacrifice speed, they're not prepared to sacrifice protection, and so they have to start sacrificing uh, firepower. And so they end up dropping from 18-inch eventually down to 16.5-inch on the initial drafts for the G3. And then when they realise they can't quite necessarily even fit that, they drop down to 16-inch, which at least matches everybody else, uh, but is kind of dragged out of them kicking and screaming. It's quite funny, actually, in some ways, because looking at the Alphabet series of Battlecruiser designs in a lot of ways resembles um, what people often call the six stages of grief, um, or the five stages of grief, depending on how you want to classify it. In it, You can almost see the designers. Initially, you have you know, the denial phase of the, the Ks, K2 and K3, where they're like, no, we, we will have a battle cruiser armed with 18 inch guns exactly the same as our battleship it's just going to be faster and it's still going to have loads of good protection um and then they point out that no we we actually can't have that without massive infrastructure upgrades so you move on to the anger phase where somebody throws out j3 which is effectively hood with triple 15s um and a few other slight modifications and then they decide that uh, okay maybe that that's gone a little bit too far the, the other way um then you get into the bargaining phase which is i3 where they're like well if we rearrange the armament so i3 is in world of warships at st vincent the tier 10 um where you have the aft turret is stuck right behind the superstructure um so this is kind of the i say the bargaining stage we're like well we if we change the main armament layout we can get 18 inch guns on a battle cruiser and then apparently no uh, then you get the h series h3 h3b h3c which is they're really the depression phase where they're just like we we want 18 inch somehow and they've gone down to you know two triple 18s and you know at one point they're looking at both forward and no aft armament at all then maybe one forward one immediately after the superstructure and then at various heights and then finally you get to the acceptance phase where they they eventually you know we're not going to get 18 inch on our battle cruisers uh with all the other prerequisites we have to go further down at which point you get the 16.5 inch g3 which is then further revised down to the 16 inch g3 and then that's the thing that's authorized and at least according to some accounts actually laid down the Panda Man 2000 asks, In a recent video, you mentioned gun barrels getting to be red hot and having to be cooled by water poured over them. This got me wondering about the metallurgy of gun barrels and if they were heat treated, and were gun barrels of, say, 4 inch, 8 inch, and 16 inch of different material quality? The answer is yes, although exactly how depends on the gun barrel and its size. So at the lower end of things, it's slightly different. At the lower end of calibers, you can get barrels that are just a single piece. Um, but if we're talking about battleship and in many cases, some of the heavier cruiser grades of firepower, you actually had different types of metallurgy applied to different layers of the gun. Now, of course, you could have wire wound guns, um, built up guns, all sorts of things. But essentially what it came down to is that the inner barrel or the liner whatever you want to call it basically the bit that the shell actually goes through that would be very hard um, and therefore heat treated it had to be because it had to contain all the rifling which has to bite into and you know um, establish traction on the driving bands and it's got to be hard enough to endure that without wearing away too quickly uh, you also don't want the inner part of your barrel to warp, expand, bulge, etc. in any way, because that's really going to throw things off and potentially cause devastating explosions. But the flip side to that is that with the amount of force and, and pressure that's building up inside there, if you have something that is very hard but therefore very brittle, um, there's a good chance that it's going to go crack, at which point uh, the gun is going to go boom and not in the good way. And so the outer layers whether that be you know the wire winding and then the outer casing or the the built-up cylinders or whatever it is you're using those outer bits would not be 
hard, it was better for them to be ductile. So in, in a lot of ways, similar to the way that face hardened battleship armor works, where you want the outer plate, outer part of the plate really, really hard to try and smash and break the incoming shell, resist its, its energy, but you want the inner part of the armor to be softer to try and hold everything together in the in the same kind of way with a battleship grade gun you want the the liner the inner barrel to be really hard to contain the explosion absolutely rigid um, you know cut into the driving bands but you want the outer section of the gun to be relatively speaking i mean it's still steel ductile and malleable in order to better absorb and contain the shock waves that are coming through from the inner part of the gun and to, you know to not split everything therefore um, it's actually not particularly risky to the metallurgy of the gun if it's getting really really hot to pour water over it and cool it down now it could be if you you know i don't know unleashed vats of liquid nitrogen on it or dumped them in straight into the sea or whatever but if you're pouring buckets or playing hoses of water over something with the thermal mass of a cruiser or battleship grade gun um you are cooling it but you're probably not cooling it fast enough to compromise the metallurgy of the more ductile outer layers of the gun and to be perfectly honest you're gonna have paint peeling and people going out oh, this needs addressing long before you're going to get to the point of you know having heated it so much that you potentially could start to lose the temper of some parts of it uh, it could happen but hopefully you'd hope people would step in and start the cooling process before that occurs and if you do that beforehand then it's much more likely again that you'll keep the temper of the metal ryan friedrich asks was there any serious attempt to hunt prince eugen in the immediate aftermath of bismarck's sinking and if not why not there was a reasonably significant search effort to try and hunt down Prince Eugen, but it wasn't anything like the same level as the attempt to hunt down Bismarck for a few reasons. Firstly, Prince Eugen was only a heavy cruiser, so you know all those convoys that were escorted by old Revenge class, etc., battleships didn't really have much to fear from her, and indeed, you know even convoys that had a couple of a cruiser or two in escort plus others they didn't depending on the cruiser type but generally wouldn't worry too much about her either um in part because you know even a even if the notional cruiser escort was technically inferior to an 8 inch heavy cruiser prince eugen would probably turn away so she presented a far less risk than bismarck had um secondly uh, a bunch of the best ships that were available for hunting um norfolk suffolk dorsetshire King George V, Rodney, etc., 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 had all taken part in the hunt for Bismarck and were now low on fuel and were having to head home to top up on fuel. And then you also had the fact that due to various engine problems that Prince Eugen was having, she was actually pretty much around the same time that Bismarck was sunk, was already on her way back. So whilst if she'd stayed out and you know actually attacked anything, they probably would have had a significant hunt for her begin to build up it was really only just starting when she wound up in Brest anyway so I'm like, oh, okay well she can stay there general dipper asks did the prize rules ever apply to any extent to royal navy operations on land for example the seizure of a fort the taking of material from slavers at their own ports or if not did they at least extend to riverine operations now, this is a matter of rules as written versus rules as applied. Technically speaking, prize law applies to stuff seized at sea. More broadly, it can be interpreted as enemy goods seized um, and taken to a prize court. So if you took material from a slaver's port, um, you know, money, goods, etc., etc., and you could physically transport them back to a prize court then usually the prize court will be like well it's enemy goods seized by a ship and you know it's movable stuff that's been taken because the thing is um most in most cases the prize money was awarded because the government was basically buying the stuff off of the crew which was kind of a throwback to the old days when a lot of the prizes you know were by privateers who technically said well i'm keeping the ship um Anyway, so 
the seizure of things that could bring material benefit to the crown, if we're talking about British prize rules, was the broadest possible interpretation. And so if it came to stuff that you seized in river or land operations, usually the prize courts were willing to say, fine, it counts as a prize if you could you know, bring it with you and show it to them and say, hey, we got this thing which may explain, at least for Royal Navy sailors, why they were so keen on basically taking everything that wasn't bolted down, and then once the invention of bolt cutters had arrived, taking everything that was bolted down as well. When it came to things like capturing forts, however, it was a lot more difficult, because the army didn't get prize money for capturing forts, and you weren't exactly going to haul a fort back to Portsmouth for an Admiralty Court, and there was every chance that that fort may not actually have be of much use outside of the campaign for the British crown. You know, they weren't necessarily going to garrison it post-war as a colony or anything. Um, so that's kind of where the grey area comes in, and usually fixed assets on land would not be counted as prizes. And of course, if something was not regarded as goods, then also that would not count as a prize. So, um, for example, here where you've got the one of the slaver ships being captured, the ship itself and any goods aboard could be adjudicated in an admiralty court as a prize if the circumstances were correct but regardless of any notional value that may be attached to the slaves aboard by certain countries at the time um, the naval crew could not claim prize money for the liberation of the slaves because as I under the admiralty court judgment they were people and not uh, property that had the system of ransoming people back had gone away with the feudal times. Brian Smith asks, how many museum ships share a name with an active warship? Uh, and were there any thoughts to 5-inch, 38 triple or more mounts instead of just double or single mounts? So on the 5-inch, 38 question, I did answer a similar question relatively recently, but basically no, because once you start getting into uh, triple mountings for smaller caliber guns you start to very rapidly lose the rate of fire which is the main attraction especially of something like a five inch 38 um, a lot of people had seen the lessons of the triple four inch that was deployed on renown and repulse at, towards the end of world war one and yeah they'd figured that okay triple or more mounts might be perfectly fine for battleship grade guns or cruiser grade guns but when you're talking about destroyer grade guns or secondary batteries um, if you want a high rate of fire for anti-aircraft purposes uh, twin is about the the highest mounting you really want to go with now in terms of museum ships that share a name with uh, existing warships there's actually quite a few albeit to be fair that's mostly courtesy of the u.s navy um, because they started naming their nuclear attack submarines for a while after states so uss texas uss north carolina um, uss missouri uh, uss iowa uss new jersey and um, uss massachusetts which actually makes up almost all of the existing uh, museum ships around um all have Virginia class submarines either in service or under construction and soon to be in service. I think pretty much the only one, only battleship that missed out on that is Wisconsin. Oh, and Alabama. So yeah, Wisconsin and Alabama don't have Virginias named after them and probably won't because they've now started to name them after fish or more accurately named them after World War II era submarines. So the last few Virginias, Barb, Tang, Wahoo, Silversides, etc., there were a few ships named HMS Warrior after the ironclad HMS Warrior, but there aren't any more. Uh, HMS Belfast is going to have a twin. One of the Type 26 frigates is going to be HMS Belfast as well. Uh, likewise, HMS Unicorn obviously had a aircraft carrier after it, but uh, there's no current HMS Unicorn in the Royal Navy. And of course, in the near future, there's also going to be a USS Constellation. Um, so yeah, there's a fair few museum ships with current in-service warships or soon-to-be in-service warships that share the name, albeit that, as I said, the vast majority are ex-US Navy vessels. 
for the most part in terms of other museum ships either they've only come out of service relatively recently so the name hasn't come around for reuse again um or they're still technically viewed as actively commissioned warships or so famous that the navies don't want to reuse the name and to be fair most other navies are small enough they don't have to reuse the name they tend to have pools of names from history that they can uh, go for whereas with the build rate of the u.s um and the fact that, you know, if you're going to name stuff for states, there's only so many states. And if you're building ships by the dozen, you are going to start reusing names at some point relatively soon. So that brings us to the end of this week's video. Thank you very much for listening. Um, still on the road to recovery slightly, but, um, you know, I've been 99% there for uh, like a week and a half, two weeks. So it's just irritating clearing the last of it nonetheless i've been also been on some rather interesting adventures which those of you follow uh, the twitter profile i have probably already know about and we shall bring you the story of those at some point in the near future if indeed you haven't already seen part of it already anyway with that cryptic statement hopefully the your day will be nice and uh, relatively warm peaceful and calm and if it's not well you have this uh, hour and 10 minutes soporific to help you uh, go to sleep and forget about it all. So anyway, see you all in another video.